okay uh, so good afternoon so as a part of this imsc diamond jubilee uh, colloquium series uh, today our speaker is professor ronnie gosla uh, so he is a professor of chemistry at the institute of chemistry uh, hebrew university jerusalem uh, so professor kosla is uh, very well known for his works in quantum control as well as quantum thermodynamics he is considered to be you know like one of the founder uh, you know founding fathers of this modern day quantum thermodynamics uh, so he he has several awards uh, so fair prize for distinguished researchers in science which he got in 1995 uh, Gold Hoff Prize in 2003 of the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. The Israel Chemical Society Prize of Excellence in 2007. And he's a member of the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science and Academia uh, Europaria. Uh, his main area of research, as I mentioned, is theoretical chemistry and quantum uh, thermodynamics. Uh, he uh, did his PhD from uh, Hebrew University, and thereafter he did a postdoc at the University of Chicago. He joined the Hebrew University as a faculty in 1981, where he, he is serving as the Stonebaum Professor of Theoretical Chemistry. Uh, some of the research highlights of Professor Kosla. Uh, so he contributed to the theory of quantum molecular dynamics. He developed methods to follow the evolution of a molecular system by solving time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, together with David Tanner and Stuart A. Rice, uh, he obtained or he originated a pump dump scheme for coherent control, which I talked about. Uh, the idea of coherent control was later extended to unitary transformations, which is, you know, is a key ingredient for quantum gates in, in quantum computation. And more recent work on quantum, on coherent control of binary chemical reactions that he has done. Professor Koslov also originated the dynamical study of quantum heat engines. And this study is a part of the emerging field of quantum thermodynamics. Uh, so today he is going to talk about uh, this uh, quantum thermal engines and quantum control. Here is Professor Koslov. So thank you for this introduction, and I'm happy to give this talk. It would be nicer if I could visit uh, India, but this is the best we can do in these days. So today what I planned is to tell you a story of the emergence of quantum thermodynamics and a uh, its relation to uh, quantum control. So this is my theme. And if you ask me questions, this is always good because it will give, get me in touch. So let's uh, start and I'll give my, the plan of my talk, which is, uh, you could say, I'm going to tell the story that I, I'm starting from the steam engine. So in a way, this is a theme in quantum thermodynamics and thermodynamics in general, that you start from an example and you generalize. So the steam engine exists. And then Carnot came and basically almost alone, generalized to a very general theory. So it, it, in a way, he's the father of this field. When he wrote his, uh, his book, it's a book because uh, he didn't publish it in a, basically his brother published his work. Uh, the conservation of energy wasn't known and the distinction between energy and entropies wasn't known. But his work is analytic. You could say he generalized in a beautiful way, which I'll allude to in a minute. And you can say the concept of entropy it came out of this, both you could say conservation of energy and the concept of entropy. So the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And I'll go through that. And eventually, 
we reach to the end of the, you can say the 19th century, where the problem of black hole radiation kind of eluded a plank to try to find a way how to describe this distribution. But it was Einstein who found out, which looked at this uh, problem with fresh eyes, that it, there is a problem of consistency. And uh, out of this issue, which I'll allude to, uh, he generally he concluded that light has to be quantized, which you could say is the dawn of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics emerged out of thermodynamic concepts. And Einstein, you can say the concept that he came out with is duality. You can say the particle uh, wave duality came out of it. And you can say out of that, quantum mechanics in general. So this is quantum mechanics. And then we move on in the vector of time and we reach to a new type of application, a laser, which was uh, you can say originally uh, originated by Rabi, but here the person I want to talk about is, is Coville, who was, you can say, one of the originators of the solid state uh, laser. And he noticed the analogy between lasers and quantum heat engines. So you can say Scoville in this concept of analyzing the laser, you can say he's the starting point of what we would call today quantum thermodynamics. So the point that I want to allude to here is consistency. Now, when we go move on in time, we know that our era is based on miniaturization. So all our computers, everything, we, once we get things small, our performance goes up, our power goes up. So here we can see, ask the question, how can we miniaturize a heat engine? How small can it be? And this is, you could say, an important question, because if we think about a heat engine that's in our car, it's macroscopic and big, and we don't have to think about quantum mechanics. But once we miniaturize it and go to a lower and lower level, we can't ignore quantum mechanics. And then the question that we can ask, do the laws of thermodynamics as we know them apply? How, how much can we miniaturize and still stay in a thermodynamic regime? And you can say that's one of the main points of quantum thermodynamics today is to basically tackle this problem of miniaturization and which theory should apply to that. And in order to that, to address this, we go back to quantum mechanics and analyze a problem that we know from thermodynamics, which is called partition. An isothermal partition is a wall between, you can say, the source of heat in our working medium. And what it means is that it allows energy to flow through this wall, but not particles or not. So we have this idea of partitions. And the question, how does it go with quantum mechanics? And we'll see that this has an important uh, sequence, which leads to the theory of open quantum systems. And here I put Lindblad, the paper from 1975. And I put Lindblad, but it's really Gurini, Kusakovsky, and Sudarshan, and Lindblad, which brought this, uh, you can say, fundamental equation for quantum open systems. And once we have these equations, then we can go back and analyze miniature uh, quantum heat engines. So we need this mathematical basis that <clears throat> I would say is one of the important results of mathematical physics in the last century to establish a theory of quantum thermodynamics. And then once we have an equation of motion and we can understand it, then we can go back to, you can say applications and the most, you can say, interesting applications of the modern era is a quantum computer. And here I have a, a small picture of a, I think, IBM quantum computer or whatever, they all look 
in a similar way. Many wires which apply to a very small chip. And we need the theory to describe a quantum computer. And a quantum computer is an open quantum system. And the equations we use to describe their dynamics is the equations we get from open quantum systems. So you can say this work of uh, the GKLS or Lindblad, and sometimes this is called the Lindblad equation, but I would give credit to all of the contributors here, as, <coughs> as you can say, is the, the theoretical basis for understanding how a quantum computer operates. And once we have a equation of motion, then we can ask questions about control. And control says, I want to uh, apply a certain uh, task, and I want to know which field to apply to achieve this task. And in the case of a quantum computer, the task that we want to do is a gate. So I want to achieve a certain type of uh, computation. And the question is, which field I have to apply to achieve this gate? And these equations of open quantum systems allow us to get a theoretical understanding of control of a quantum open system. And I'll allude to this issue. And we found interesting surprises in this problem. So this is my plan of the talk today. And uh, so let's jump into it. So we start with Kalno. And here is a heat engine in the, you can say, abstract way. I have a hot source. I have a cold source. And if, if we leave it alone, we know that heat flows from hot to cold. So you can say this is a basic theme in thermodynamics, that the natural flow of heat is from hot to cold. And if we put it through an engine, we can, you can say, harness this heat flow and get work out of it. And the question that Carnot asked is how much work you can get out of a, a temperature a gradient. And when, when you read his book, it's, it's really beautiful because he doesn't have really the modern tools that we have to understand it. On the other hand, he reaches the conclusion that an ideal engine is a, there is, is an ideal engine and its efficiency depends only on the ratio of the hot temperature, of the cold temperature to the hot temperature. So all engines, if they're ideal, would reach this is the maximum efficiency that we can get, the conversion of heat to work. And you could say that this analytical type of analysis, which wasn't based on any specific model or anything, but trying just to understand how this can work, uh, has led to the idea of entropy, which came later. And we know that for irreversible process, the entropy of the universe should increase. And for an ideal uh, case, we, the entropy change should be uh, zero. So this is the lesson that we learned out of from Carnot. And as you say, what we can say, we got this idea of entropy out of it, which you can say developed through thermodynamics. And now we jump to uh, quantum thermodynamics. And you could say what I want to point here, the thermodynamics led Einstein to his this idea of quantization of, of light. So what did Einstein here in this uh, famous 1905 paper uh, say? That he looked at the entropy of light inside a black box. And once it's restricted to uh, a black box, he calculated its entropy here is this. And he looked at the entropy, as you say, of a mono, monochromatic radiation inside the uh, box. And the conclusion he 
took out of there, and this is the words of Einstein in the English translation, that monochromatic radiation of low intensity within the range of validity of Wine's relation formula behaves thermodynamically as if, as if it consists mutually independent energy quanta of magnitude uh, k beta ni over n. Now, what Einstein uses as beta is what we know today as h bar. So the analysis of Einstein was, again, analytic. He looked at the problem and he said, if light has the same entropy as an entropy of a gas of free particles, it should be particles. Now, you can say that's a very far-reaching conclusion, but this was the power of Einstein's thinking that he looked at consistency. He said, if light has to be consistent with thermodynamics, then this is the only solution. Now, Today, when we teach, sometimes we refer to this paper as the explaining the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect wasn't measured in 1905. It was only measured in 1913 by Millikan. And if you look at the title of Millikan's paper, it's basically to try to determine the value of H bar or of H, Planck's constant, through the photoelectric effect. So, Einstein wasn't trying to explain an experiment. This is, you can say, the way of thinking, which you could say natural. When you have a problem, you try to think. He was thinking in an abstract way and an analytical way <clears throat> how things should behave for, so in a way, what you could say that Einstein said that any theory should be consistent with thermodynamics. So, we jump from here, and we jump from the problem of a laser. So now quantum mechanics has been de uh, developed, and we go to 1959, and we look at the work of Scoville, and he analyzed the most simple model of a laser, a three-level, you can say, laser amplifier. And what we have here, we have a hot source, was TH, I have a cold source here, TC, and the hot source is coupled to the two upper levels in this, you can say, model of three levels. The cold source is coupled to the two lower levels. And what we can think about that this hot source equilibrates these two levels, and the cold source equilibrates the two lower levels. And then if we get what we call a gain or population inversion. So the NH is larger than NC. Then if we come with radiation, again, through Einstein's relation, we'll get stimulated emission and we'll get an amplification. So if we want to think about this as an engine, we put heat and populate this point here. We couple this transition to radiation, and in this case, we consider radiation as pure work. So this is the work output. And then we close the cycle by cooling through the cold bath, and that's how we can think about this three-level amplifier working. And Scoville's idea was, okay, this should work as a heat engine. So then you can do a very simple calculation. You can say, okay, what's the population at the upper level, and you put Boltzmann in relation with the right frequency. What's a population at this intermediate level? Again, you put Boltzmann population with the frequency and the temperature, and you want positive gain, means that the upper population is larger than the intermediate one. And out of this relation, you get this inequality which tells you that the frequency ratio should be smaller than the temperature ratio, which immediately tells you that the efficiency, which is, you can say, is the ratio of the frequencies is smaller than the Carnot efficiency, and we get equality when we get uh, zero gain. So what Scoville uh, concluded from that that the three-level laser is an example 
of a ideal, it could be an example of an ideal heat engine when the gain is zero. And by that, he established the connection between, you can say, a quantum device, a laser, and uh, classical thermodynamics, which starts from Kelvin. But then, once you could say that's the power of an understanding, once uh, Scoville understood that, he said, okay, now I have a heat engine, and we know from our home appliances that the refrigerator is a reverse of a heat engine. So if we reverse this, we can get a refrigerator, and this is all what we have to do is reverse the arrows. Now I put work by radiation. I pump from this level up to this level. I dissipate into the hot bath. And I close the cycle in the cold bath, which means I'm cooling the cold bath. A process like that we call laser cooling, which is, you can say, one of the fundamental technologies that we need for a quantum computer. Now, Scoville realized this. Here, this paper from 1959, and, and this that he can reverse uh, the three-level laser. The interesting point is that although this was published in a you can say now standards a good journal for the time, it was ignored, you can say. And laser cooling was reinvented by uh, Wineland and Hench, you can say uh, eight years later in a mechanical way, not in a thermodynamical way, as a way to cool ions in which is what we use uh, today in ion computers. But there was, no connection, you can say, to this uh, idea of Scoville, which came much before, and in a way which is much more general, because once you understand that, you can understand how laser cooling works, and you can understand also other, you can say, modern cooling schemes which we need for quantum technology. So let's go on from here, from this idea, and study this point of consistency. So what we saw that quantum mechanics emerged from thermodynamics, but now we want to do in a way the opposite. We want to see how thermodynamics emerged from quantum mechanics. You can say thermodynamic theory stayed kind of on the sidelines and quantum theory from, you can say, this paper of 1905 until today developed tremendously. So this is the basic theory that we teach in, in physics or in science in general. So people are much more familiar with uh, quantum mechanics and its concept than they're familiar with thermodynamics. So let's try to play the opposite game. Let's try to see how thermodynamics emerges out of quantum mechanics. So then we can, once we have something like that, we can ask how does a thermodynamic viewpoint relate to a single device or in the quantum limit, which is really is the question of miniaturization of a quantum heat engine. And then we can ask, okay, what is quantum in a quantum heat engine? Is there really something really quantum there? And is there quantum supremacy? Is there an advantage in reaching to this uh, quantum limit? So these are questions that are asked in quantum thermodynamics. And let's uh, go to this theory. And uh, again, the idea starts from consistency. So when we think about quantum thermodynamics, we try to find quantum analogs of the laws of thermodynamics. You can say the zeroth law, the approach to equilibrium, the first law, the energy balance, the second law, the ent entropy balance, balance, and the third law is the existence of the absolute zero and you can say unattainability of reaching this point. So this is what we want to get out uh, today, starting from quantum mechanics and sees how it relates to the thermodynamic uh, laws. So there is, you can say, an important point about quantum thermodynamics that, that allows us to treat dynamics. You can see thermodynamics 
or classical thermodynamics is not a dynamical theory, although it has the word dynamics in it. It deals mostly with equilibrium states or quasi-static states that change very slowly, and it doesn't have built into it the problem of dynamics. And this has been realized as a disadvantage of classical thermodynamics in a field of what's called finite time thermodynamics has emerged, which tries to ask the obvious question, how much we, much we pay for power? And here I have two examples. I have this, a fast car, and here I have a slow car. And I can ask which car is more efficient in the sense that it burns less fuel per kilometer. And that, if you look at it, the answer is obvious. If you look at this, I think it's a Maserati, but I'm not sure. If you look at this uh, green car here, on, it's not green at all. It's very powerful and very wasteful. And so we immediately just by intuition, we know that there's a trade-off between power and efficiency. And this was a subject of a field that started in about 1980s, which is called finite time thermodynamics. And they realized that there's a trade-off. Here I show it in this graph. Here is the power divided by the maximum power. So this point here is the maximum power. This point is the maximum efficiency. And the point of maximum efficiency has zero power. And that's very obvious because we know if we want an ideal engine, it's very slow. It has to be close to equilibrium. And if it's very slow, the amount of work divided by time is going to be zero. So the point of maximum efficiency has zero power. But then we can ask, okay, what is the efficiency at maximum power at this point here? And there is almost a universal relation, at least for high temperatures, that tells us that the efficiency at maximum power is one minus the square root of the temperature ratios. Sometimes this is called uh, kurzon alborn efficiency, it was first observed by Novikov, which analyzed, uh, you can say, nuclear power plants in the Soviet Union. So this is a result of a very simple, uh, you can say, uh, optimization, which relies on heat transport. And you get this result. And what we find out today that this result is much stronger than its original derivation. So if you ask me, how much do I pay for maximum power? In, Normal circumstances, it's about half. So if the efficiency of a conventional power plant, if you take the temperature difference would be about 70%, half of that would be the ideal efficiency, the Carnot efficiency. Practically only half of it is the efficiency at maximum power, and this is what's uh, delivered. So this is the rule of thumb. Now you can do much better, this equation is better. It's not correct at low temperatures, but this is this idea that there's a trade-off between a power of inefficiency. And now once we use quantum mechanics, we can address this issue directly because we have equations of motion. So how do we do that? We, we have to use a partition, because we can't treat the whole world. We have an open quantum system. And the scheme is that here is my system. The primary system could be my working fluid. There is a partition or an interface between my system and the world. And I put the world as a big bath. And usual typical assumption that it's big, its heat capacity is infinite, so it has a constant temperature. and we have flow of energy through or heat through this interface. And the question is, how do we treat this? And quantum mechanics, what it says, puts a boundary on everything. And it says everything inside this boundary is described by 
unitary or Hamiltonian dynamics. And the Hamiltonian that generates this dynamics has a system Hamiltonian, an interface Hamiltonian, and an environment Hamiltonian. So this is the total Hamiltonian. And we have a unitary dynamics of, you can say, the universe in this case. So sometimes this is called the church of the Hamiltonian, but you don't have to be, uh, but in a way you have to be a believer because we don't know how to do what happens here because we are in the system. So there is a, an assumption here that the whole universe is unitary. And if we take this assumption seriously, it means that the total entropy of the universe is constant because unitary dynamics doesn't change uh, entropy. But what we're interested in is not in the universe as a whole, we're interested in the system. And then we can see that if we have this asymmetry that the system is small and the bath is big, thermodynamics will emerge. So this is the scenario that we are talking about, which we call, and now what we need out of this is to get equations of motion that we can describe our systems. And here is again, this is our Hamiltonian, the generator of our dynamics. And the theory that we use is a theory of open quantum systems. So our system is described by a density operator. This is its evolution in time. And I like to call it a map. So I have an initial state I apply a map on it and I get the final state. So this is an abstraction which is very useful here. And in this case, our map, the unitary map, is e to the power of the commutator with the Hamiltonian times t. So this would generate, you can say, the Louisville von Neumann uh, equation. Now, this is the equation of motion of the universe. This is not what we want. We want the equation of motion for our system. So we assume that for the system, there's also a map that's described its dynamics. It takes us from time zero to time t. And I have uh, this map, which I call lambda here. And it also has a generator. I can write it as an exponent of some... L here, which is the Louis Villian. And if I can write an exponent like that, then I get an equation of motion, a differential form, and I have an equation of motion for my dynamics. So this is, at this point, it's wishful thinking. I want an equation of motion, a differential equation. The existence of a map is assured, but it's not sure that I can get out of it a differential equation. So the question is under which conditions I can get this type of equation of motion. And the answer for this came from the work of, uh, you can say, GKLS, and you can say before that by Krauss. And what they showed in this beautiful work in mathematical physics, that this map is called a completely positive map. It can always be described by this form here, which is called Krauss form, which has this condition. So this is a dynamical map, which is completely positive. It means it preserves the positivity of the density operator. This is what we need here. And what Gurini, Kusakovsky, and Lindblad and Sudarshan found that if we want a differential form, it has a structure. And the structure is very rigid. We mean the equation of motion has a commutator with the Hamiltonian, that would be the unitary part, and it has a dissipative part that always has this structure. So this is what they were able to, to prove that this is, you can say there is a most general structure of a Markovian dynamics of a reduced description. You can say, if you have such an equation, you can always say that I can always find a Krauss map, and which is, means I can always find an environment that will uh, 
uh, give this type of equation. So we have kind of a mathematical picture, but this is in a way beautiful mathematics, but it's not yet physics. It all what it tells us that if we want a completely positive map and we want a differential form, this is what we get. So we have to proceed to thermodynamics. And this is what we did. So we said, okay, let's put thermodynamic restrictions on our map and see what we get. So the first thing we say, our dynamical mark map is Markovian, which means we our time is continuous, has no memory. Now, the environment remains in a stationary state. So the, you can say the physical idea that the environment is large, it was very large heat capacity, so it doesn't change. And it's in the thermal state or at least stationary, that's sufficient. And if we look at the fixed point of the dynamics, where does it lead to? It should lead to thermal equilibrium. So the fixed point of our dynamics is a thermal state or a Gibbs state. So this is assumption number three. And the assumption number four says the composite system satisfies strict energy conservation. What does it mean? This is an idealization that tells us that there is no uh, energy accumulating on the interface. So you can see the total sum of energy of the system and the environment is constant. So let's examine this uh, idea a little bit. So here's my system, my quantum system with energy levels. Here's my environment, here's the environment, here's the interface. And the assumption is that the interface is very small. So it's an interface. So I don't accumulate energy here. If I don't accumulate energy here, you can say the energy of, of, on the interface is constant. So it commutes with the total Hamiltonian. So it also commutes with the sum. So this sum is a constant of motion. So this we call strict energy conservation. And once we see something like that, that we have a commutator, it tells us that there is a certain symmetry here. This is a lesson that we learned from Emmy Noter, that once we have a commutator that's zero, we have a hidden symmetry here. And the hem hidden symmetry here is that the unitary part and the dissipative part commute. So we'll see that this has implication on the equation of motion. Not every equation of motion should fulfill this idea. And let's elaborate on this a little bit. Here, I'm going back again. Here's my total Hamiltonian. My interface Hamiltonian commutes with a total Hamiltonian. I'm looking at my map, my dynamical map. And what we want that the fixed point of my dynamical map would be a Gibbs state. This is the zeroth law. The first law we have built in that we have conservation of energy, which implies that my dynamical map commutes with a unitary piece. So it's the same thing as saying that the Hamiltonian commutes with a generator of the dissipative dynamics. Now, if you think about this, this tells us something about symmetry. And the symmetry that we are, have here hidden is a symmetry of time translation. It means that the bath can't be used as a clock. It means that once I couple to a bath, I'm going to dissipate. But I can't read from the bath the time. Now, when can I read the, from the bath of time? If it would oscillate, I could count oscillations. I would get a, an idea of, a, of time. So you can see this is an assumption. And then we want the second law. And this has been proved to first by Lindblad and by other people that a dynamical map, a completely positive dynamical map is contracting, which means that the distance in this case, I use a divergence from equilibrium is uh, all the time decreasing. So it means that this dynamical map monotonically will converge to equilibrium. 
So we built a theory that we have dynamical symmetry built into it. And now we can see the consequence that we get a master equation, which means the equation of motion for a reduced system that has a Hamiltonian unitary part and a dissipative part, which has this structure. And since the two generators commute, they should have a common eigen operators. It's not eigenvalues because these are super operators. And you can say the eigen operators of the unitary part are, you can say, jump operators, and they have a, a Bohr, Bohr frequency associated with them. But it means that they are common eigen operators also for the dissipative part, so they share common operators. And if they share common eigen operators, then you can say the two generators will uh, commute. So we, we get a very rigid structure of the master equation, which we know now is consistent with thermodynamics. So we did the big step forward, we know we have a consistency of our equations of motion between quantum mechanics and thermodynamics. So now we want to do control, for example. So we want a driven system. So we have to enlarge our description to include the, you can say the drive or the controller, which I put here as a Hamiltonian of the controller. And the question is, how do we treat a system like that? Again, we want to get this dynamical map and we want to get its generator. But in this case, we have also the controller. So to deal with this issue, we lump things together. We put another partition. We take the system controller and their interaction as to being a super system. And then we're back at where we were before. And there, then some, uh, you can say uh, uh, development or analytical considerations, we get that the, in the interaction representation, you can say the super operator has to commute with the total uh, unitary evolution. And we can go to a semi-classical description, which allows us to get this expression that the free unitary dynamics of the system has to commute with the dynamical map. So once we have this, again, we can get out of this the master equation for a driven quantum system, which, as I said, will be consistent with thermodynamics, which is very important. So we call this master equation the non-adiabatic master equation, we call it name, and we can derive it, and what's Important here that these jump operators that appear in the master equation are explicitly time dependent because they have the drive included in them and they're eigen operators of the free uh, unitary uh, dynamics. Okay, so now we did a big. It, you could, I could say that this progress to reach to this point took about 30 years of work and consideration. So now we can describe the Carnot engine. We have tools that we can write equations of motion for the Carnot engine. So first of all, Carnot engine or Carnot cycle we have, it's a four stroke engine. We have a hot to cold adiabat, adiabatic stroke. We have a cold isotherm. We have a cold to hot adiabatic stroke and we have a hot isotherm. Now in the language that I'm talking about in quantum thermodynamics, there are maps. So I have a Carnot cycle is just a product of these maps. I first go from, you could say from, a cold to hot, then I do cold, then I go from hot to cold, and then I go hot. So this is my cycle. I can describe my cycle as a product of a dynamical map. So it's also a dynamical map. 
And what I'm looking for is the fixed point of the cycle. This, from this, I can analyze the performance of the engine. So again, we can use the theory of open quantum systems to describe our kernel engine if we can describe each branch separately. Now, what's interesting, if you look at any engine, including your car engine, these operations here, or these maps don't commute. You can change the order. If you want to change the order between these two uh, operations, your engine will explode. So you could say here is an interesting point. You here you have a case where even in a macroscopic state, operators don't commute. So you could say in your car, your four cycles don't commute. And then you can ask the question, where does it come from? Does it come from a, thermo, uh, a quantum mechanical source that two operators don't commute or from somewhere else? And you can show that for a macroscopic engine, it comes from a stochastic uh, master equation in a way that doesn't commute with the unitary part. So it's not directly quantum mechanical. There's detailed balance built in, into it, but you can reach to the quantum limit and then the reason that they don't commute is a quantum mechanical reason that operators don't have to commute in quantum mechanics. So here's the Carnot engine, and you can see the difficult part is this branch, this isothermal branch. We're moving, we're changing our system, our Hamiltonian, while we're connected to the bath. So then we're driving it in this branch, so for describing this isothermal branches, we need the equation of motion that I showed you before, the name, which is this non-adiabatic uh, master equation. Now, if we are adiabatic, even if we construct this uh, engine out of a qubit, which is uh, you can do easily, you would recover Carnot. Because as Carnot told us, this is universal. So if I do adiabatic, if I follow this path here, and I look at the efficiency, I'll get Carnot efficiency. But if I want to get power, I'll drive it faster. I will be out of equilibrium. I'll get more power, but I'll get uh, less efficiency. So now we have equations of motion. We can solve it. I won't show you all the solutions that we obtained, but some typical examples. So th these lines here, this is this Carnot cycle that we choose here. Here is the coordinates or entropy and the frequency that we change here. In this case, the working medium is a harmonic oscillator. And you see, we're never on equilibrium. Our cycle is either inside or can touch equilibrium points, but in general, it's not equilibrium because we want to drive it in finite power. So this is an, it just shows you the result that what I showed you before, this is the power divided by the maximum as a function of the cycle time. And the red line shows us what happens when we, when we have very long cycle times, we reach the Carnot efficiency with zero power. And this point is the point of maximum power. And here, we're not very far from what's called the cool zone Alborn efficiency. Not exactly, there are a little bit more, but we're not, since it's quantum, we're not really restricted to this low dissipation limit, which we would get. This blue line here is an auto cycle also a quantum autocycle. In a way, it's easier to analyze autocycles than Carnot, but I won't go into it. Now, if we look at what happens here in this uh, finite power cycles, we try to drive things fast. And if you try to drive something fast, you are not a diabetic. It means you generate excitations in your system. So excitations, we have shown that they're equivalent to friction. We call it quantum friction. And if you dissipate these excitations, you basically lose power. 
you have to extract, use more work, you dissipated it, and you lose power. So generating coherence, which is what is needed to generate these excitations, costs you work and reduces power. So these cycle trajectories, and you can see this coordinate is an energy and these other coordinates are coherence. We see that these engines cycles generate a great deal of coherence. They are far from equilibrium and they're dissipative. And why do we do that? We do that because we want to equilibrate faster. So I'll allude to that in, in a minute, but this is, uh, you can say, the analysis of the Kalno engine, and now we'll try to understand what's happening here. Okay, so before I start, here is a, a, a very nice a experimental realization that was done in the group of Ferdinand uh, Schmidt-Kaller with Kilian. And they asked how far experimentally they can reduce an engine. So here is an engine that's composed of a single ion. So it's a single ion in a trap. It moves like that from right to left in this, between these electrodes. It's, here is the, the cycle. You can say they, they change the energy levels by moving the particle be close and the, where the electrodes are more crowded to less crowded. So the, here is high frequency, here is low frequency. So in a way, this is more like an auto engine but they were able to realize experimentally a quantum heat engine that works on a single ion. Now, you could say since this paper in 19, uh, 2016, there have been other examples of that, and now it's realized that the heat engine, there's no lower limit. A heat engine can work on any level. It's not restricted to being macroscopic, and there are examples of using Josephson junctions and other cases of doing quantum heat engines, which are, you can say, the miniaturization reached the quantum level. And then when you look at this engine, the question is, is it quantum? And then in this case, you could argue about it, but there are other cases which have been analyzed, which show that the amount of action that you produce per cycle, which is really the measure of the internal motion of the working medium, is on the range of h bar, which means they're quantum. Now, eh, let's eh, move to the final part that I want to talk about is quantum control of open systems. And the question about control we want to start from an initial state and reach to a final state. This is our objective. And the rules of the game are that we can't control the environment, but we can control our system Hamiltonian by applying some field. Now, the equations of motion are, again, the Louisville von Neumann equations of motion. And the dissipative part we'll see has to depend on the Hamiltonian part that we saw that because of consistency with thermodynamics. Now in control, there are two, there are three issues. One is controllability. What are the conditions and the dynamics which allow to obtain state-to-state -state objective? This is the theory of controllability. Then there is an issue, let's find the mechanism that reaches control. And the final point is optimal control theory. Let's find the best control. Sometimes this is related to the quantum speed limit. And now let's look a little bit about state-to-state -state control, about an example. I have a system. This is, would be uh, relevant for the Carnot engine. At a certain temperature with a certain Hamiltonian, and I want to equilibrate it by, I want to change the Hamiltonian and stay at the same temperature. Now, if you think about it, this changes the entropy. So there's an entropy change in this transformation. 
So this transformation cannot be done with a unitary transformation, but it can be done with an open system dynamics. So the question is, I have, what is the protocol to change the Hamiltonian from initial one to the final one and stay at the same temperature? So this is the first question that we wanted to answer in state-to-state -state control. We could write the equations of motion as I showed you before. And here are the, the solutions which were quite interesting for us and gave us a lot of insight. So here is like a quench. I start with a high frequency here in this case, and I lower my frequency of my system. So the question is, what's the best protocol? And here the protocol is, let's, what's the frequent, how should I change the frequency to reach to my objective with very high fidelity at a certain amount of time? So this is reduced time. So what we found out that the objective is reached by undershooting. If I want to go from high frequency to low frequency, the protocol that we found goes through even a very low frequency, you see 0.5, and then goes back to the right frequency. So this is a much faster than this is, would be the diabetic protocol, and this would be the quench protocol, which has ba very bad fidelity. This would take infinite time, and the quench relative to this has orders of magnitude less fidelity and success. So how does it work? You can see the up just before that, the opposite is when I go from low frequency to high frequency, I overshoot. And I overshoot quite a bit. If I want to go here from one to two, I overshoot up to a value of six or seven. So how does it work? It works in a way in a non-adiabatic fashion. I generate coherence. So fast motion generates coherence. I'm not you know, diagonal in my Hamiltonian. Now, once I have coherence, I'm very far from equilibrium. So I have fast dissipation. So I accelerate my approach to equilibrium. But my equilibrium point doesn't have coherence. So what you do, you first generate coherence. So this is this move here. And eventually, when I got to the right dissipation, and basically, if I did the right entropy change that I need in this transformation, I get rid of the coherence, I rotate back, and I go back to energy. So I start with a state that's on the energy shell, has only energy, has no coherence. I generate coherence in the middle, and I end with a state that, again, has no coherence. Why does it work so nicely? Because I'm all the time far away from equilibrium. And the, you can say the rate of dissipation is a distance from equilibrium. And in this case, the distance from equilibrium comes from coherence. So this is the lesson that we learned from uh, this uh, analysis. And once we understood that, we can do other control tasks like transformation between two equilibrium states. This is what I showed. I can start with a non-equilibrium state and I can. we found a transformation that goes to a lower temperature than the bath, which was a little bit surprising. But then if you think about it, you're not violating any laws of thermodynamics. You're putting work. So if you put work, you can be in a temporary case lower than the bath temperature. I'll go back to that. So here's what I showed you now. This is a constructive approach to control. The free dynamics are solved by the inertial approximation. Significant coherence is generated. You can see non-adiabatic drive mixes energy and coherence. And the fast equilibration is achieved by Mapemba effect. Now, Mapemba effect is an interesting story. This was a popsicle uh, seller or merchant in Tanzania who wanted to make popsicles on the beach. And he found out that if he starts to freeze his popsicles with hot water, they freeze faster than if he uses cold water. 
And this is quite surprising. You would think if I want to freeze something, I should start as cold as possible. And he found the opposite. And so this is effect is called on his name. And I was so curious. I tried this out myself with liquid nitrogen and it's correct. <laughs> I did it at my kitchen. And uh, the reason it works that the, you're far from equilibrium. If you're far from equilibrium, you relax faster. And then in the end, you do a unitary move and you reach back to equilibrium. Now, for the effect in water, it's more complicated. I can explain it later how it works, but uh, it's more complicated than, than what I showed you here that we completely understand how this effect works. Okay, so now uh, we, we can say we can go to open system quantum control. Here we have the equations of motion. Here is what I allow myself to change in the Hamiltonian. And we can have two types of control. What I described before is state-to-state -state control. And I have, can have process control. I can try to control a process itself or a gate. These are the two things that you can do, or the general two things that you can do. And you can ask, what is the controllability theory, constructive mechanism, and the op optimal control strategies, as I showed you before. And when you think about quantum control, the agent of control is interference. This is how quantum control works. So it's not always easy to see that, but this is really the, what makes quantum control. So if I have an initial state and I have a wave leading to the objective, I want the constructive interference in my objective and destructive interference everywhere else. So this is the motto of uh, coherent control. And if we think about dissipation, you can say there is a conflict because if I have dissipation, I ruin my coherence, my wave property, and then you can say I can't achieve uh, coherent control. So we can think about the quantum controllability of open systems. And for unitary, the controllability theorem is a theorem in Lie algebra, and this has been established, I would say, 40 years ago. The rank condition generates this any unitary. The controllability condition for open quantum systems with entropy change are still open. I would say that's a field open to, you can say, mathematical physics to try to establish the rules for open system control. But you can specifically ask for entropy changing control tasks. What I showed you before is this fast equilibration, the Mapemba effect, laser cooling, reset of devices. This is a Landau eraser, quantum annealing. So these are all cases that we need uh, quantum control of entropy changing transformations. So we looked at that, I would say the last three years. And as I showed you, the system and environment are linked and the agent of control is degraded. So you can say there could be a problem here. And we wanted to look at that using optimal control theory. So this is what we did. And we could say this, we looked at it as an algorithmic problem, how to solve optimal control theory for a quantum system, an open quantum system. And since we have equations of motion, we know how to develop it, we can solve this issue. So we can guess a control field, we construct a master equation, we can calculate the evolution, utilize a final state to get our objective, and then from this objective, update our field and close the loop. So we have done this task for quantum control. Here it's again, you guess a control field, 
you calculate the unitary dynamics. Out of the unitary dynamics, you calculate the dissipative dynamics. You solve the dissipation. You evaluate, evaluate the control objective. And you update the field. You close the loop until you converge. So this is something that we have done also before for unitary cases, for gates. So we said, OK, let's explore open quantum systems. Here's the equations of motion. And let's look at the results. So the first thing we did is, as I showed before, state-to-state -state control. I want to start from a certain state and finish at a certain state. So the state that I'm finding here is this is for a qubit. It's on the Bloch sphere. It's somewhere in the middle. And I look, can look for two problems, either heating, which means I reach the origin, because the origin is infinite temperature, or cooling, which means reaching the surface of the Bloch sphere. And you can say we have a Hamiltonian that looks like that. We did it for two-level system, for three or for four, it doesn't really matter. The point is that here is the control field. This is a control field that finds a solution. And there is a trajectory in this Bloch sphere that starts from, you can see the initial point here and finishes in the final point there. So we find the solution. So you can say it works. We can do state-to-state -state control. So now we were much more ambitious. Let's do process control. Let's find gates. So now we have, let's find, do process control. Here's what our target is to find the gate which is independent of the initial state. So for every state, it takes an initial state, a final state, and what we want to calculate is the gate itself or find the control field that gets a gate. And we have two types of gates here. One is a reset gate. A reset gate says, no matter where you started from, I want to finish at a certain uh, point. So that's some, you can call it Landau eraser in a way. It erases all initial information. And the other gate is a unitary gate. Here in this case, we chose the Hadamard gate, which is a standard gate. And we took our mechanism of optimal control theory and we found solutions with very high fidelity. But the interesting point, how do these solutions work? So, Let's look at the solution for the unitary case, the Hadamard gate. We get it with accuracy of five digits. So we start here. Hadamard, if you start at the x direction, you, you should finish on the min minus z direction in the Bloch sphere. So this we found a trajectory, a solution without noise, without the dissipation. So it's a unitary solution. We know how to do that. So we found a solution get, that gets absolute fidelity from the initial to the final state. Then we turn on the dissipation. So if we start on the surface of the Bloch sphere, since we're dissipating, we end up where this flag here, inside. So it means we not only we didn't reach the target, but we lost purity, our state is not pure anymore. So in a, in a way, it's a useless gate. Now, if we apply optimal control theory with a dissipation, we find perfectly a, a very high fidelity solution it starts here, ends here, and with a trajectory that all the time follows the Bloch sphere. So this was quite amazing when we saw that. How does it work? How can a system be in contact with the bath all the time? And if we don't do anything, it's going to dissipate and it's dissipating as we can see here. How does the solution uh, work? And it took us time to analyze this idea. And then we figured out that what's happening here is not that we're decoupling from the bath. On the contrary, we're the solution requires a lot of power. So if we look at, the, you can say, the power or the entropy generation, there is very large entropy generation, which means that the work that we need 
to drive this uh, gate goes to as dissipation, as heat into the bath. So there is a lot of heat generated, but we're able to keep the, in this case, the qubit cold and do a perfect unitary transformation. So what do we find here? This is a generalization of a refrigerator because we're not talking about cooling a state. We're talking about cooling a process. So we can have a process under dissipation and it stays cold throughout this process provided we pay the price of thermodynamics. We have a very strong irreversible transformation which generates a lot of entropy. Now, we could do this. This is the Hadama gate here, just to show this is the objective. And we get to very high fidelity to our objective. And if here's the entropy production, it's huge. It's a few orders of magnitude uh, more than the change in entropy in, in the system. So system entropy changes very little or basically nothing. And, but the entropy generation, which goes to the universe, is huge. This is how uh, this works. And here is the field. The field doesn't look something very special about it, but it's a protocol that's able to execute this uh, gate independent of the initial state. Now we could do a two qubit gate. So now we're universal. If we can do a one qubit gate and a two qubit gate, now we have all what's needed for universal quantum computing. And it works in the same way. We can do a qubit gate. Here's the gate over here. This is how the gate looks like. So we do, a, in this case, we chose an example. It's called the square root of a swap gate. And we can get it for very high fidelity, again, with the price that we dissipate a very large amount of energy into the bath. So here, again, is a generalization of a cooling process, which if we think about it when related to technology, and I just came today from a meeting of about quantum computers, and I'm in Germany now uh, currently, and the issue is if you want to build a quantum computer, usually you think that you want to isolate from the environment. In this case, it's a completely different paradigm. You want to execute your gates and be very far from equilibrium and cool it, find a protocol that you cool the process while you do it. And with this, I'm going to conclude. I talked about open system, uh, control. And the main point for thermodynamic consistency, the dissipative and the unitary generators are linked. And you can say the dissipative generator is determined by the free dynamics. And if you control the free dynamics indirectly, you modify the dissipation. And this is what we need to control entropy. And we can do entropy changing transformation. And we identified the following control mechanism, the reset by the Mapemba effect of coherence generation and active cooling while performing unitary gates. And with this, here is uh, two recent papers which summarize part of what I said. The recent work, other older work is published. This paper here describes the work on uh, gates. And here is a, a review written on uh, quantum optimal control and quantum technologies. And with this, here's the people that helped me to uh, produce it somehow. The, uh, their names, I'll mention them, got erased. This is uh, Roy Dan. He's a graduate student, just finished now, a fantastic student. This is Shimshon Kalush, a longtime collaborator on these issues. Amikam Levy was a former student. David Tanner, collaborator on control for many years. I think we have been working together at least 30 years. And earlier work by Alon Bartana and Ander Toblina 
And here's Christiana Koch, which was also influential in this uh, work. And with this, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to describe my work. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Koslov, for such a wonderful talk. Uh, now this question session. Uh, any question? Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful, thoughtfully structured talk. A lot to observe there. Uh, I have a quick standard question. Uh, uh, regarding shortcut to adiabaticity, is there a I mean, your method of overshooting and achieving a shortcut to thermalization, I'm sorry, not to adiabaticity. Uh, is there a, a limit how fast you can do it? Uh, can you do it arbitrarily fast or is it limited by a quantum speed limit or something like that, a thermodynamic speed limit, something like that? Okay, I'll, I'll try to, and, and so, so let's say I want to do fast thermalization. And Okay, so, so the question is, what are the resources you are willing to put into it? And you can say the, the quantum speed limit is uh, the standard one, is determined by the amount of energy or temporary energy you're willing to store in your system. And then and you can see the energy change in a way. Now, if you're willing to put infinite resources, you can be very fast. So, by itself, you can say if you're not uh, restricting the, the energy that you are willing to store temporarily, you, the quantum speed limit in a way doesn't limit you. Now here we have a different situation because uh, we're coupled to the to an environment. And uh, so you can say the the, the, the rate of uh, equilibration depends on the coupling to the environment. And so this is a little bit uh, uh, more delicate issue because the environment it, you, it wants to accept this energy in certain modes. So the question is how fast can you do that? And you're limited by the speed of sound in the environment. So this is sometimes called uh, uh, the Lieb bound. Because if you generate an excitation on the interface, it has to propagate into the environment and the speed of sound inside the environment, or if it's the environment is electromagnetic uh, radiation, that's a speed of light. So there is a limit to how much you can uh, put into the environment. So there is an intrinsic, uh, you can say, bound that happens here once you try to describe that. So there is a scaling here that's, so that it can be infinite. Now, when you uh, overshoot or undershoot, what you do, you're not changing any rules. You're just trying to stay as fast as, as far as possible from equilibrium during most of the process. So that you could th think about it in three steps. First, you generate coherence. So you immediately are away from equilibrium because in equilibrium, the coherence is zero. So you're far from equilibrium and you dissipate fast. So you can say the rate of dissipation determines how far you are from equilibrium. And you could say if you can generate the you can't generate infinite amount of coherence because there's also there's a bound to that, how much coherence you can uh, generate. And so, so th that's the best you can do. You're far from equilibrium. And at the final step, you cash on this coherence, you change it back to population and you land on an equilibrium state. So this is, you can say the optimal protocol without too many restrictions that uh, you can you can do. Uh, there is a speed limit for that, for an open quantum system. It's more involved and uh, 
the process that I'm described is under this bound. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Uh, other question? Hello. Uh, may I ask a question? Hello. Yeah. Sure. First of all, thank you, Professor uh, Koslo, um, for this nice talk. Actually, uh, uh, I want to uh, ask this question that uh, von Neumann entropy uh, is used in quantum thermodynamics uh, uh, in many work. So uh, how good it is, uh, or I'll say, uh, I mean, is there some limitations? Uh, uh, compared to thermodynamic entropy. Again, I, I didn't get the, the question. Ask it again. What is uh, my what question? Is you? Uh, my question is that uh, uh, that we often use von Neumann entropy in in, in quantum thermodynamics. Uh, but some there are there, there, uh, some people or, or I'll say some there are, there there is some debate about that to use one moment entropy uh, with thermodynamic entropy. I mean, uh, so how good it is? I mean, the, as an as, as an entropy, uh, how good it is? I mean, the one moment entropy. Okay, I'll, I'll try thermodynamics. To, yeah. Okay, I got the question. So there there is a you can say a standing dispute between the equilibrium thermodynamics and what's called even in classical thermodynamics between the Shannon entropy, which is, you can say the analogy with the von Neumann entropy. But in, in general, an ent entropy is not some unmeasurable quantity. It's, we need it. And you can say the, the von Neumann entropy, the way I use it, it's, it's constant under unitary transformation. So if I apply unitary transformation, the von Neumann entropy won't change. It doesn't change, yes. Yeah, but now, if I put a partition and I look at, and I do a balance of the entropy of the, you can say the system and the bath, their sum of entropies is not, the sum of their total von Neumann entropies is not the total entropy because there's entanglement. You could say if I have a pure state mm -hmm. uh, partitioned in between two parts, between Alice and Bob, the von Neumann entropy of the each party would be larger than zero, but the total entropy for a pure state is zero. Yes. So sometimes this is called the entropy of entanglement. So the von Neumann entropy is a very useful concept, but you have to relate it correctly to quantum mechanics. You can say part of the irreversibility that appears here is because we impose these partitions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the partition is, that's why we're human. We are in a certain, we're localized at a certain part in space. Yeah. So we can't really grasp the, the, the global so you can. So that's why w when I started, I say we can assume that the global evolution is unitary and conserve the von Neumann entropy. But locally, we don't see that. Yes. And and there is even work by Wheeler that you can prove that you we can't know the difference. Locally, we can never. If the we cannot never. Universe uh, is pure. Uh, okay. Okay. Now, okay. I would yeah, even if you use some about, other generalized entropy like Renault entropy, the qualitative behavior will be the same, right? Yeah, so you could say I would put another issue here, which is in equilibrium, mm -hmm. we count the population and the energy levels, and we can calculate the, what I would call the energy entropy, yes. which in this case would be equivalent to the von Neumann entropy. Yes, yes. But once we generate coherence, the energy entropy will increase, but the von Neumann entropy will stay constant if we just do it by unitary transformation. So you can see the difference between the 
uh, von Neumann entropy. And the energy entropy is a good measure of coherence. It's one of the... I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. So there thank is you. another question. Hello. Hello. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. So, so when you talk about this single atom heat engine or any kind of quantum heat engine, so there you talk about two uh, very important parameters like power and the efficiency. But other than that, any small quantum system is prone to the fluctuation, right? So, yeah. so do you do you think that there should be a more complete description, uh, I mean, like including the trade off between power fluctuation and uh, efficiency itself? Yes. Okay, I would answer your question. You're completely right. I didn't describe that. When you have a small system, fluctuations become extremely important. And there is recent work on, uh, I would say, a triangular trade off between one. One point would be uh, fluctuations, the other point would be uh, efficiency, and the other one is power. So if, let's say, you want to limit the fluctuations, you have to pay with power. So I would say this is a, an important point, and you can see there's recent work of the last two, three years, which do address this issue in a very nice way. I see. Thanks. And there is another question I have. Is like when you were uh, doing this open quantum, uh, I mean, open quantum system, control of open quantum system. So there you showed that uh, covariance can actually make the process faster. Also for that, you have to pay an extra cost. So in the context of quantum thermal engine, can we, can we say that covariance is, I mean, like, is there any kind of trade-off, like how covariance is beneficial or it's like, uh, like covariance, well, what is the role of covariance as such? I mean, like in conclusion, like, Okay, yeah. so, so when you generate coherence, you're going to increase your dissipation, that's for sure. But then right. maybe you can increase your, your power because you can do things faster. Right. So, so you can say that when you generate power, you pay with coherence. And coherence, mm -hmm. if you look at it, is very close to ideas of what we have about and our intuitive ideas about friction. When you try to do things faster, you generate more coherence and have more dissipation. So the trade-off comes from this relation. You can say fast means non-adiabatic, non-adiabatic means coherence, coherence means a lot of dissipation. And so the efficiency goes on, but your power goes up and there is an optimal point. That's it. Thanks. Thanks for that. Any other question? Uh, so I have a small question about this shortcut equilibration. So you said, uh, uh, so there is the use of this Ampere by effect. Um, uh, so is there any other way to, uh, to achieve the shortcut to equilibration? I mean, uh, rather than using this Ampere by effect? Um, I don't think so. I think you could do it in different ways, but I think it will always be something like that. If, because if you look at it in a formal way, when you solve the, you can say, dissipative equation of motion, you can look at the eigenvectors of the dissipator. So what you want to be always that your state will be expanded by the largest eigen, eigenvalues, which relax faster. The reason that uh, typically when you do a quench, eventually what happens, you lose the large eigenvalues and you wait for the smallest eigenvalue to decay. Okay. So if you can eliminate that, then you go fast. Nice. If you can expand your system now, the unitary part allows you to change the representation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, if there is no more question, let us uh, thank Professor Ronnie Koslov for such a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, uh, I, so we, I, we wish that you could come to Chennai to visit our institute, you know, yeah, maybe like in the future uh, if you come. 
okay so thank you very much for this